Hello, and welcome to the presentation on CT Chest. This is an interactive tutorial to teach you the basics of approaching a CT of the chest. Once you know this, you'll be ready to shine. This presentation is laid out in three sections. First, we will discuss the different types of chest CT. Then, we will go on to discuss how you should systematically approach the chest CT every single time. Last, we will discuss some common disease patterns and their differentials. Let's begin. There are four main types of CTs for imaging the lungs. The first is the standard CT, or the equivalent of a spiral helical CT. Second is the high resolution CT. Look how crisp that image is. Next is the low dose CT. And last is the CT angiogram. We will explore all four a little more now. In helical CT, the patient is continuously moved through the scanner as the source and receptor rotate around the patient. The slice thickness or collimation is 3 to 10 millimeters. At centers like Mount Sinai Hospital, this, it's roughly 5 millimeters each time. In a standard CT, 100% of the lungs are imaged, not just thin slices in specific spots. Standard CT give you a full lung image. These scans are very useful in emergency rooms where a fussy child or a delirious adult needs a critical chest image. The advantage is that the entire helical CT scan can be done in less than a minute. Usually these patients can stay still for that period of time. The images in a standard CT can be obtained with or without contrast. The indications for chest CT are numerous. Here is a short list. In high resolution CT, transverse images of thin slices of lung between 1 to 1.3 millimeters thick are obtained. These are obtained at non-contiguous intervals, usually 1 to 2 centimeters apart throughout the whole lung. The computer then reconstructs the images to give high spatial resolution. This process results in images that show fine detail, but only 5 to 10 percent of the lung is sampled. This type of sampling is appropriate for evaluating diffuse lung disease. However, focal lesions may require more images. For parenchymal disease, it is important to get as detailed a look as possible. High-res CT can detect and diagnose individual diffuse lung diseases like sarcoid hypersensitivity pneumonitis and pneumoconiosis like asbestosis or silicosis. It also has greater diagnostic value in certain diseases that involve the airways and pulmonary air spaces like bronchiectasis, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, cystic fibrosis, and emphysema to name a few. We are increasingly using chest CTs. This has the potential to increase the radiation burden to the general population. It is important that we reduce this. Conventional chest CT is usually performed using settings between 220 and 280 milliamps. Low dose CT would bring this dose to about 50 milliamps. Studies have shown that a substantial dose reduction is actually feasible for chest CT for two reasons. One, contrast is already inherent in the chest, and two, absorption of radiation is actually lower in the lungs. Low dose chest CT can be performed without seriously jeopardizing the image quality. Low and ultra low dose chest CT are already being used in some institutions, primarily for lung cancer screening. This is not, however, routine. Studies are underway to assess the role of low-dose CT scans in early detection of lung cancer in patients with emphysema. 
CTA is a CT where iodinated contrast is injected into a small peripheral vein. An automatic injector controls the timing and rate of injection. It is safer, more efficient, and cost-effective than conventional catheter angiography, and it has essentially replaced these. With the results, accurate 3D casts of the blood vessels can be made on the computer, which offers much better detail than MRI or ultrasound. The indications are listed here above. In PE, to accurately check for a filling defect, the scan is timed such that the contrast is in the pulmonary artery during the scan. The risks associated with CTA often involve the iodinated contrast and are allergic reaction to the dye and nephrotoxicity. Now we'll switch gears and focus on the basics of looking at a chest CT. It is important to have a systematic way of approaching the chest. There are three windows. The first is the window that highlights the soft tissues, as can be, as can be seen here. Next is the bone window. This highlights the bony structures. And lo and behold, the lung window. This highlights the lung parenchyma. When looking at chest CTs, I would suggest switching from windows in this order, or else you might get bogged down by the lung parenchyma and forget about the bones and the soft tissues. Remember, the key is to be systematic. The soft tissue windows help evaluate the mediastinal structures, pleural fluid, and calcification. As you can see, aerated lung is black, bone and calcium are white, muscle, heart, and large vessels are light gray, fat is dark gray. It is on this window that you should look for lymph nodes, both axillary and mediastinal. Also, remember to look at the coronal as well as the axial views. It's like a double check verification mechanism. Use whatever images you can. And now, see which structures you can identify. The width of the main pulmonary artery should be less than 3 centimeters. If it is more, then it is likely that the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so you've got a few things. Here's a bit more of a hint. Okay, think you've got them all? This is just one of the slices that you should know. But there is more anatomy that you should learn when looking at a chest CT. For more information, go to the anatomy teaching file, also found on this website. Staff always like to know what this tiny structure is. Don't be fooled by its size. It is mighty important. Once you are done looking at the soft tissues, change to the bone window. In this view, the bony structures are emphasized. Scroll down once and watch the vertebrae. Focus on them. Look for fractures, lytic lesions, sclerosis. Next, scroll up and watch the sternum and the manubrium. Next, Scroll down, looking at the right ribs. Then, guess what I'm going to say next? Scroll up and look at the left ribs. You'll see fractures and lytic lesions, sclerosis, and other things if you follow this approach every time. Of course, now we come to the most important window, the lung window. In this window, air appears black, aerated lung, dark gray, and other structures white. Again, there is an approach to looking at the anatomy here. First, we'll look at the airways. Look at the trachea, the central airways. Is it patent? Are there secretions? Is it rounded? If it's round, it means that the patient has taken an adequate inspiration. If not, you'll have to question an inadequate inspiration or perhaps an expiration. Next, 
we look at the right bronchial tree. Of course, we would then move to the left side of the bronchial tree. Both times look for anatomic variants, mucus plugs, airway collapse. Look to see that the airways do indeed taper. Last, we'll look at the lung parenchyma. Do it by lobes. Try to find the fissure lines. They are either well demarcated black lines or simply avascular lines. Start with the right upper lobe, then the right middle lobe, then the right lower lobe. Repeat this for the left lung. Often, the radiologist will be looking for nodules here. They are tiny white flecks amongst a sea of other white tiny flecks. How can you identify them? The answer is to follow the vessels. If the white flecks move, then this is a vessel. If they do not move on three consecutive slices, you can be sure there is a representation of a 3D structure and not just contrast within the vessels. Okay, so the first two sections covered the basics. Now, let's get a little more sophisticated and explore the common pathology that you are bound to see. Learn them here, then call them out when you're reading a scan with a radiologist, and you can be sure to impress. Air bronchograms allow you to see the air-filled bronchi because the surrounding lung is of increased attenuation. An air bronchogram implies that the proximal bronchi are patent because you can see the air going through them. This sign was originally described to identify lung disease and distinguish it from pleural disease. Now it has become another name for airspace consolidation. Remember, however, that it may be seen in association with a variety of lung parenchymal abnormalities like atelectasis, lung consolidation, and interstitial thickening, to name a few. Bronchiectasis is the abnormal dilatation of the medium-sized bronchi that are greater than 2 mm in diameter caused by the destruction of the muscular and elastic components of bronchial walls. The proximal bronchi are less affected because they have more cartilage and are more resistant to dilatation. Damage to the muscular and elastic components of the bronchial wall is caused by either infectious or inflammatory cytokines. These bronchi can't clear the secretions, which then leads to further colonization and infection with pathogens. This contributes to further purulent expectoration and results in further bronchial damage. Thus, bronchiectasis is a cycle of bronchial damage, bronchial dilatation, impaired clearance of secretions, recurrent infection, and more bronchial damage. There are three types of bronchiectasis. In cylindrical bronchiectasis, the bronchi are uniform, their walls are parallel, and they do not taper. Cystic bronchiectasis is a severe form. Here, the bronchi look like cysts, and this type usually extends to the pleural surfaces. Varicose bronchiectasis is an uncommon form. The bronchi have a beaded appearance and areas of dilation followed by relative narrowing. High-res CT has replaced bronchography as the diagnostic tool of choice for bronchiectasis. HRCT is non-invasive and ha very high sensitivity and specificity. The secondary pulmonary lobule is a fundamental unit of lung structure and represents the lung in miniature. Airways, pulmonary arteries, veins, lymphatics, and the lung interstitium are all represented. Perilobular pulmonary disease is disease that occurs close to interlobule septa and the periphery of lobules. Septal thickening reflects perilobular pulmonary disease. In other words, abnormalities of the interlobular septa or peripheral alveoli. Typically, the interlobular 
septa are well developed in the lung apices, and septal thickening is often well depicted in this region. The most common causes of septal thickening are listed here. Try to look at the picture and establish where you think the septal thickening might be. Did you get it? Crown glass opacity is a frequent but non-specific finding. The underlying abnormality is diverse. Basically, any condition that decreases the air content of the lung parenchyma without totally obliterating the alveoli can produce ground glass opacity. The histology will show minimal thickening of the alveolar walls and septal interstitium and an alveolar lumen partially filled with fluid, macrophages, or neutrophils. Ground glass needs to be differentiated from a true consolidation. In true consolidation, the area appears white because the lung opacity is obscuring the vessels. In ground glass opacity, the degree of increased lung opacity is not sufficient to obscure the pulmonary vessels. Thus, if we look at the images here, you can see vessels running through. Ground glass opacity is potentially reversible with appropriate therapy if the underlying disorder is treated early, because none of the changes in lung structure are permanent. Some active but potentially reversible processes that produce ground glass opacity include pulmonary edema, alveolar proteinosis, to name a few. Emphysema is the permanent enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioles and destruction of the walls without obvious fibrosis. The differential includes, well, number one, smoking, number two, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is often seen in young patients at the lung bases, immunodeficiency syndromes like PCP and HIV, and connective tissue disorders like Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos. High-res CT is more sensitive and highly specific for diagnosing emphysema than conventional radiography. However, the information gathered from CTs does not alter therapy, and thus CT scans are not part of the routine care of patients with COPD. I want you to look at this picture. This is a young patient with bolus emphysema at the lung bases. Where do you think the diagnosis is? There are three types of emphysema. The first is centriacinar, or lobular. This begins in the respiratory bronchioles and spreads peripherally. It is associated with long-standing cigarette smoking and is found predominantly in the upper half of the lungs. The second type is panacinar. Here, the entire alveolus is destroyed. This type is predominant in the lower half of the lungs. It is associated with homozygous alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The third type is the distal acinar or the paraseptal. This involves the distal airway, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs, and it is found localized around the lung septae or the pleura. Here, apical bullae may spontaneously rupture, causing a pneumothorax. Look at the picture on the right. What two types of emphysema are found here? Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death. Early lung cancer, like tumors less than 3 centimeters, has a 5-year survival rate of 70 to 80 percent. Thus, prompt diagnosis and management is very important. Generally, a pulmonary nodule must reach 1 centimeter in diameter before it can be identified on a chest x-ray. CT is good for detecting nodules as small as 3 to 4 millimeters. Clinical history is useful in assessing whether the nodule is benign versus malignant. We want to know, did the patient smoke? Is there a history of malignancy? Did they travel to areas where TB may be endemic? Did they have occupational exposure to things like asbestos? Next, we want to look at the CT scan. Benign lesions of less than 15 Hounsfield units are more than 95% predictive for benignness. Seeing fat within the lesion or a halo sign is also a good sign that the lesion is benign. If it's smaller than 0.5 centimeters or has been stable on repetitive CTs for the past two years, this is, these are all good signs. Malignant lesions, however, 
or multiple have irregular or speculated margins show more contrast enhancement. Although, caution should be taken because active infectious lesions may also enhance. Can you spot the nodule? The differential diagnosis of a chest nodule is listed on the table above. More than 95% are either going to be primary neoplasms, <coughs> hematoma, or infectious granulomas. Look at the picture below. These nodules are circumscribed. Thus, we can suspect that they're metastatic disease. If the nodules were more septated, then we would suspect a primary lung cancer. CT angiography is highly sensitive for pulmonary embolism and can spot endoluminal thrombi in central as well as second to fourth division pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary thromboemboli appear as a well-defined hypodensity in the pulmonary artery. CT can also lend itself to additional findings. For instance, you can find a pulmonary infarct, which is a well-defined wedge-shaped density with the apex pointing to the pulmonary artery and the base along the pleural surface. Spiral CT is also useful because it can determine the age of the thrombus. Usually, if the thrombus is pushed to one side or is crescenteric, that means it's old and chronic. The CT is also useful to rule out other pathologies which may present similarly clinically to pulmonary embolisms like pneumonia, pneumothorax, or aortic dissection. The sensitivity of CT angio now closely matches the more invasive gold standard of pulmonary angiography. Thus, CT angiography is the diagnostic tool of choice. There are some limitations to spiral CT. For instance, you can't evaluate the arteries below the fourth segmental level. However, the clinical significance of such subsegmental pulmonary arterial thrombi has not been established. Also, there are some interpretation pitfalls. For instance, anatomic landmarks and variants, like intersegmental nodes, frequently cause filling defects. Also, vascular tumor invasion may look like this. In fact, the radiologist looking at this scan couldn't tell if the filling defects on the left were from pulmonary embolism or tumor invasion. Last, technical pseudo-filling defects may also mimic pulmonary embolism due to inappropriate selection of injection parameters, flow rate, concentration, scan delay, or breath holds. Remember, Clinical correlation is required. Thanks very much and good luck.